you so you mentioned the the psychopath element of things and and one of the funniest things I discovered from reading the book was that uh, was it Washington DC is the highest concentration of of psychopaths per per capita in, in is it in the world or is it just America? Well, it's in it's in the U.S. and you know we can't be certain because the sample sizes are reasonably small. But I, I do love that finding because it does sort of jive with people's suggestions yeah. of where these people gravitate towards. Yeah. Well, I mean that doesn't necessarily mean it's the politicians. It could be all their assistants, you know, <laughs> or the lobbyists, or, or the yeah, lobbyists. all sorts. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's it kind of it's it's yeah it's a bit of a magnet for for probably the wrong kind of people. So, uh, w- what is your assessment of of why? Um, psychopaths and the people with um, those sort of that that dark triad of personality traits. Why why do they get drawn to par in 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 your understanding? Yeah, so the, the dark triad is particularly destructive. It's it's Machiavellianism, narcissism, and psychopathy. Being a psychopath, and it, those three in in combination are what's the real problem. Um, Machiavellian narcissistic psychopaths like the idea of being in control and they like the idea of controlling other people and they don't have any problem with abusing other people. They don't have emotional responses like most of us. Now, one of the things that I I thought was an interesting nuance in talking to these experts on psychopathy and the dark triad more generally was they would say, look, you know, most of us have moments where we become a little bit more narcissistic. There's parts of our life where all of a sudden our ego comes to the forefront or we become a little bit more Machiavellian. We'll, we'll, we'll sort of strategize and scheme and maybe break little rules in order to get where we want to be. The difference with people with the dark triad is that they're turned up pretty much all the way, right? They're, they're really high. They're not that they have little doses that sort of come out from time to time. It's that they're sort of always there. And what was also really interesting to me was hearing from all these experts the same sort of line where they said, look, the, the people who can actually control these impulses, they're what are called the functional psychopaths. They end up in business and politics and, and you know powerful positions. The dysfunctional psychopaths that are so surging with these traits that they can't control them end up in jail because they're the serial killers, right? So uh, what, what's, what's interesting is you, you don't have the actual all the way up guys in power. You have the close to the all the way up uh, guys in, in, in power. Now, for them, you know, con- power and control is a, a really big payoff. But the worry that I have, and this is where, you know, one of the main arguments and one of the main reasons I wrote the book is you have this hum- human tendency, first off, for power hungry people to seek power. Psychopaths are a special subcategory that's particularly power hungry and particularly bad at wielding power once they get it. But we design systems that either cater to those people or repel them. And and one of the main reasons I wrote the book was because I was trying to say like, look, we have designed a system that is uniquely good at getting psychopaths into power because it relies on performances, short-term performances like job interviews, promotion interviews, elections, in which superficial charm, which is what psychopaths are notorious for, is a huge asset. Right. And, and the flip side of being sort of an introverted person who operates with integrity and doesn't boast, that's difficult to get elected. It's difficult to get promoted because you're constantly being modest and so on. So I think we have to think carefully about the systems we design that either amplify the ability of psychopathic, narcissistic Machiavellians into power or, you know, sort of repel them and constrain them more. And, and right now, I think, honestly, I mean, we've done a really good job of designing systems that a superficial, a superficial, charming, chameleon-like personality is particularly good ex- at exploiting. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the, your book went really nicely hand in hand with a, with another book I'd read last year um, from, um, Isabel Harbin. Uh, it's called mm-hmm. Why We Get the Wrong Politicians. So whereas you were looking sort of more on the side of like psychologically, obviously you 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 talk about the systems as well, but she was almost exclusively focused on the systems that give us the politicians that we have in the United Kingdom, at least. Um, and one of the things that I, I, I was curious about while reading both of your books is the extent to which you think the media have a role in sort of promoting that kind of person as as a potential leader or as someone that you think you should vote for you know do, do you think that there's um like what what part of that or what 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 sort of extent do you think the media play in in like us picking those kinds of people yeah so i i have a slightly unconventional view of this i think because i think some people will say 
uh, the media is responsible for this and they're the ones who make the, the, they're like the kingmakers and so on, which is partly true. I mean, there, there is some truth to that. But more I think about, you know, let's imagine that you're trying to run for office and you're going to have to go through the media gauntlet. In other words, in order to get elected, you're going to have to get scrutinized incredibly closely and you're going to be in the spotlight all the time. The question of who, who gets through that gauntlet unscathed is a choice that society has made based on what we think is sort of a bad interview or a good interview or a good media performance, a bad media performance. To be somebody who shines in the media spotlight, you have to be really affable in these sort of short bursts. You have to be really outgoing, charming. You have to you know, be very slippery at dealing with questions. I mean, one of the things that I, I think about sometimes is like I listen to the radio for uh, today program interviews where they, you know, whenever a government scandal comes out, they throw some sca- sacrificial lamb to be <laughs> just absolutely destroyed on this interview. And the, the the person just sort of tries to um and ah through the 10 minutes to make sure they don't, you know, get destroyed completely and do their best. Now, there, that creates an incentive in which when you give like a, a normal interview answer, like you actually answer the question, there's huge risks associated with it. There's huge risks associated with being like your normal self because normal people are flawed, right? And so I, I think one of the things, this is where I simultaneously denigrate systems, but also sort of turn the mirror back on ourselves. And I haven't talked about this that much, you know, in, in around the book. So it's a great question to, to ponder, but I sort of think, you know, what would it look like to have a world in which normal well-intentioned but flawed individuals could ascend to the highest echelons of power. Mm. And I think it would mean that they had to answer questions where they're like, I don't know. Or they'd have to say like, gosh, you know, I have changed my mind on that. And it's not a problem, right? I actually, I, I saw some evidence. And, and so, you know, some of the ways in which media dynamics operate create incentives for politicians to basically either deny answering questions, you know, refuse to answer a question or to lie, uh, or to simply put on a face that is obviously false, right? Like it's, it's clearly not actually them. And so I think there's sort of two aspects to it. The easier one to understand is the kingmaker aspect where media, you know, media does respond. And the Trump example is a perfect one for this. We're like, you know, live televising his rallies because they produced good ratings mm. was an unfor- unforgivable choice, in my opinion, uh, especially given that they weren't doing that for the uh, other Republican candidates or for the Democratic candidates at the time. Yeah. So I think you have to be fair and you have to not respond to chasing ratings. But I think you also have to understand that there's this sort of dynamic that we have set up in which, you know, being a human being in the media spotlight is actually potentially destructive for your chances of gaining, gaining higher office until that changes. I mean, I think about this, you know, I don't know if this is the case for you, but I, I've thought about running for office when I was younger mm-hmm. and like when I was like a kid, right? And I like quickly changed my mind on that because I was like, this is horrible. Like the whole system is horrible. Everything about it is just a atrocious experience for the individuals unless the power is worth it to you. So for most people, they think like, this is going to be a terrible experience, but at the end, I get the power. Well, those are the people who self-select and that that's the problem, right? Everybody who weighs up the costs and benefits and sees the cost, but thinks the benefit is power. Those are the people you don't want to be in charge. And yeah, that's sort of the system we've designed is which those are the ones who are actually going to run for office. Mm. I went on quite the journey there during that answer, <laughs> because at the start I was thinking, hmm, because you're right about how they, they uh, you're definitely right about how they televise Trump's rallies. Like they would televise a, an empty stage for two hours, like on CNN, it just yep. because, uh, you know, because it was Trump. Um, uh, and it, when you were, you were talking about their sort of chasing ratings. And I was wondering, first off is like, is this, is this a function? Is it getting worse because the corporate or sort of like the traditional legacy media are, are struggling to hold on to eyeballs and, and, and the mm. audience. And I was like, is, is that what's causing it? Like maybe the internet makes that better. Um, but then when you talked about the cost, I was like, no, the internet 100% makes it worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. I, one of the things that's a joy about being an, an, an author and an academic and not a politician is I can give my honest answer to these questions, right? I can sort of just reflect on them a bit. And one of the things that I've been struck by, again, it's, I think it's a mix of both of these things. So I think that like there are, are de- there are decisions that are made in some media organizations in which they have specific sort of 
agendas and aims. I mean, you know, looking at Fox News, there, it's quite clear that there is a specific bent to that organization that has a clear narrative line that if you yeah. deviate from it, you might have your show canceled and so on. I think one thing that's slightly different from that in my own experience. So, you know, I, I do some TV interviews in the US, but I also write this column for the Washington Post. And one of the things that I found really interesting, it's not, you know, my, my editor has been really supportive of me writing about a whole bunch of different things. And in fact, has sometimes said, write about the stuff that isn't, you know, the obvious clickbait, write about the stuff that's, you know, might not cater to everybody, but is going to be an important you know, story. But as a writer, you also look at this and you're like, I write about Donald Trump. I get, I look at the comment section, which is a rough proxy for views. Yeah. And there's 2,500 comments, right? So a huge amount. I mean, that's a, that's a large amount of, of discourse. You're presuming tens of thousands of people read it if you're getting that many comments. I write about, you know, what's going on in an important area of global affairs that isn't getting much attention Two comments, right? <laughs> and so there's, there's, there's this issue where it's like, on the one hand, you have sort of a, 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 an issue with corporate governance of media and all this stuff, but you also have, you know, what do people read? Right. I mean, this is this is the problem with discourse around power is that, you know, I make the point in the book that power is relational. So as much as we hate our leaders, if we live in a democratic society, yes, OK, there's flaws in our democracies and so on. But if we live in a broadly democratic society, we do have to own up to the fact that a significant chunk of the country has elected the people that we hate. Mm. Right. So like, yeah. there's. There's this, there's this sort of push and pull between supply and demand when it comes to power uh, that's very, very complicated. I don't think we have enough introspection about why we uh, pick the wrong leaders or why we create a media system in which it's profitable to do things that are potentially counterproductive for democracy. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the video. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and leave a comment for us in the comments below. Let me know what you thought and if you'd like to see more of this from the show. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time.